Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's keep going over today. So, uh, remember, the quiz is due tonight. So, quiz um, nine. Um, due tonight. Definitely finish the material for it. So, make sure you take that um, tonight or just right after class, okay? You know it's nice out. Just go get it done, okay? Um, quiz 10 for now will just keep as due on Wednesday. Uh, I'll evaluate that again on Monday to find out where we are in, in, um, in the, the material to see if we'll keep that due date. I did decide to push the exam back a day um, to April 17th, so um, just keep that in mind. It'll be the Wednesday of that week, okay? Not the Monday, which is what is on the syllabus, and the primary reason being that we lost a day to, to uh, snow, okay? All right, so um, our riddle here. Uh, with pointed fangs, it sits in wait. With piercing force, it doles out fate. <clears throat> Over bloodless victims proclaiming its might, eternally joining in a single bite. What is it? A, a, oh, a stapler. Stapler, exactly right. A stapler. Eternally joining maybe is a little bit too much. Maybe that's not eternal, but, but it still works. Okay. All right, now. Uh, let's see here. Let's get to, that's not where this class is. It's a different class. Okay, so we left off right here on uh, Wednesday, right? We covered on Wednesday some of the details of how electrons will move through complex one and complex two, um, making it from either succinate or NADH to ubiquinone, which makes ubiquinol. There are lots of other processes in the cell that will reduce ubiquinone to ubiqu ubiquinol as well. In fact, really you could say that most, if not all, oxidative processes in the cell will send their electrons eventually to ubiquinol, and then those electrons are gonna be used by this complex, which we began talking about <coughs> on Wednesday, which is complex three, or cytochrome BC1. Um, it's going to take that ubiquinol, it's going to oxidize it, uh, and it's going to give those electrons to this uh, peripheral membrane protein, cytochrome C. Okay, and it takes two moles of that because uh, there's a heme group in that cytochrome uh, that can only accept one electron at a time. Okay, at the same time, it's going to move four protons across the membrane, what we call pump them. Now, we are going to spend a little bit more time looking at complex three than we did complex two, and the reason is because there's uh, a much different mechanism for getting electrons through complex three than there was both complex one and two, which was more of this kind of straightforward movement, hopping along iron sulfur centers. This is a little bit different, something that we call the Q cycle. Okay, complex three, um, just as a reminder, it's got these uh, total 22 subunits. Really, the subunits that we care about today, though, are cytochrome B, cytochrome C1, and this iron sulfur protein. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward here. This slide I'm not gonna spend really any time on. It just shows you the protein at the top are 22 subunits, and then it just kind of whittles it down to the subunits that we're gonna talk about. But let's just go right here, and I'll just show you the subunits here, and then we'll start looking at um, the process. Let me go ahead and, and focus in a little bit as well, okay? So what you are looking at here, I'm gonna go ahead and draw um, a line between these two. On the left of that line would be round one of something that we call the Q cycle. And the Q cycle is the term that we use to describe how electrons get through this process or through this complex, I'm sorry, okay? Now, um, in terms of subunits, let, let's just name some here. Uh, this subunit here, okay, I won't highlight the whole thing, but it, this guy right here, Okay, that's cytochrome B. Okay, it has two heme groups in it, heme BL at the top, and then heme BH here, okay? Shown in blue, if you can kind of capture that blue outline here, this guy right here, that would be the iron sulfur protein. Okay, and it's got a single iron sulfur center in it, and we call that iron 2S2. It's right there, okay? 
And then finally, and you can barely see this, um, it's in orange, okay? This subunit, some of it's down here, but most of it's behind, um, behind these other two subunits. That would be cytochrome C1. Okay? And it has then in it a heme C1. And that's right here. Okay? And then finally at the top, this is not really part of complex 3, binds complex 3. Okay, but this is cytochrome C. Okay? And it has a heme C in it. Okay? So those are the parts. Okay? Now, that doesn't tell us anything about how the electrons move through this. It just highlights the parts of the complex, okay? We want to look at how electrons are going to move through this. And like I said, they're going to move through this process or through this complex through this process called the Q cycle. And it's going to take two rounds to get the electrons, um, two electrons to cytochrome C, okay? Now, you also notice here, let me, let me just put little stars in this. You'll notice these little spots here. It says QP and QN. Um, those are not uh, anything but just spots for ubiquinone or coenzyme Q to bind, okay? So QP is where ubiquinol will bind. It's close to the P side. So the P side is uh, at the top. So we can put up here P side. This is the inside down here. And that's where the, we find the QN side. And the QN side is where another coenzyme Q will bind, okay? So that's what's being highlighted there. Now we'll start our, um, our, our discussion here all the way at the top where ubiquinol will enter into the QP site. Okay, ubiquinol, again, remember, is coming from pretty much all the oxidative processes in the cell. It's catching all those electrons from somewhere. Okay, and what's interesting about this um, is that uh, it's actually going to split its electrons. So it will be oxidized in a single step, but the electrons will go to two different places. One of them will go up to the iron sulfur center. So let me go ahead and trace those out with this kind of purple color here. One set of electrons is going to go in this direction. Okay, it will go first to the iron sulfur center. When it does that, it will actually induce a conformational change in the iron sulfur protein that will move it up towards C1, and then those electrons will be put on C1. Or those, not electrons, that electron. Okay, there's only one of them, okay? And then that electron will give, be given to cytochrome C, and cytochrome C will then take those to complex four. Okay. And that then has moved, of course, a single electron through the process, or through the, through the complex. The other electron that comes on ubiquinol is going to go in the opposite direction. Okay, and I'll use this kind of light blue color to show this. It's going to first reduce heme BL, and then BL will pass its electron onto heme BH. Okay, now here's what's really kind of odd, if you will. That electron will go into the Q insight where a ubiquinone molecule, a co uh, oxidized coenzyme Q, is sitting waiting for it, and that electron will end up on the semiquinone radical. Okay? And that would complete then round one of the Q cycle. One electron goes up, gets on cytochrome C, off to complex four. The other one goes down and ends up back on a coenzyme Q molecule. Okay, so partially reduced coenzyme Q. Now importantly, the last thing that we need to recognize here will be the, the protons. Okay? These two protons on the ubiquinol that gives up both of its electrons, they will diffuse based off of proximity into the P side, and we say that they are pumped at that point in time. And remember, those protons were put onto ubiquinol by either complex one or complex two or something else, and they all came from the inside.
Okay, so those protons now have traversed from the inside and now are on the P side. And we say they're pumped by complex three. Okay. At the same time, there's a proton down here that's coming again from the inside that will be used okay, to protonate or partially protonate this um, ubiquinone in the QN site. What we need is another arrow or two on this one. And if I could get another couple arrows on this, it would become even more clear, right? That's a lot of arrows. <laughs> okay. Actually, we do need an arrow right here. There we go. See? Okay. Whew. I feel better now. All right. That's round one of the Q cycle. Questions? Yes? <clears throat> yes, yes. Okay. The question was, the cytochrome C only hold one electron? That's correct, because the heme group only has an, one iron, okay? And so there's only really one place for that electron to go, is that that iron? Okay. Other questions? Yes? So <clears throat> what exactly is happening between uh, MABH and uh, the QN? Well, Here? Yeah, okay, so the question is what exactly is happening between heme, BH, and QN? So what's happening is, is this electron, these are actually in close enough proximity. What you can't really see here is that ubiquin, ubiquinone will actually bind right here, and this will transfer an electron to it. We're not looking at the chemical details of that, okay? And a proton will protonate that, so that'll just make the semiquinone radical. There's no intermediates, though, in between them. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Yeah, okay, so this question leads me over here, <laughs> okay? So round two of the, of the Q cycle, so if you didn't hear what happens to the semi-quinone radical here, um, well, round two is essentially the same thing except for the only difference between round one and round two is what's in the Q insight. The Q insight starts now with a semi-quinone radical, okay? So an additional then, for round two, an additional ubiquinol comes into QP, and again, we start to split our electrons, okay? So one electron goes up this direction, okay? Just like we did last time, that will then reduce another mole of uh, cytochrome C off the complex four, okay? The other electron here is gonna go in the downward direction, okay? BH, BL, into the QN site, but this time it's going to go to the semiquinone radical, okay, making ubiquinol, okay. That then, right, requires another proton from the inside, and I have one more here, and these two, okay, protons here will again diffuse into the P side, pumping two more protons. So if we zoom back out here, oops, there we go. Okay, we have a total of four protons, two here, two here that move to the P side, okay, that were originally derived from the inside. We have a total of two cytochrome C's, one, two, in each of these complexes, or in each of these cycles, or rounds, I'm sorry, that get oxidized. So we have two, uh, not oxidized, but reduced. We have two cytochrome C's here, they become the cytochrome C's um, with the iron two plus, okay? Four protons on the P side, okay? And when you start to keep track of ubiquinol, two ubiquinols were oxidized, but one ubiquinol was regenerated. So stoichiometrically, we have only one ubiquinol that's being totally oxidized. Okay, and that's really all I should say, or really all I need to say regarding complex three. Okay, we're skipping obviously some chemical details here and how it is, you know, electrons move on to these things, that kind of stuff. But um, for what we want to accomplish in this class, this is fine. Okay. 
Additional questions on the Q cycle on either one of those rounds? Yes? Uh, okay, so the question is, how is ubiquinol synthesized? Do you mean the molecule, like coenzyme Q, as a total? Um, huh? It's not a protein. It's just a small molecule with a, a, a lipid tail, essentially, and then a ring on it. Um, I don't know. I have never looked at that biosynthetic pathway. So um, I'm fairly certain that we have the capacity to make it in our bodies. I know that it's sold as a supplement. Um, so you can ingest it. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's one of those essential things, like a vitamin. I, I'm not sure if, if, you, if we have, or if we lack a biosynthetic pathway to do it. Other questions? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, is cytochrome C like, interacting directly with the um, complex and then it's released into mm -hmm. the complex? Yeah, so there's a, it, you can't really see it here. This is not really accurately drawn. Um, but the question is, uh, is there a cytochrome C? Will that interact directly with the, the complex? And yes, it will. So there's a docking site for cytochrome C on it that's adjacent to this cytochrome C1. Or re, it's not really cytochrome C1, it's a heme C1. Um, and then the electron is transferred. Yes? Okay, I'm just validating. Um, from what I'm seeing with the, stoichi with the stoichiometric parts on the, for all the product side yeah. of the equation, um, with how the proton goes through, you know, uh, all of the, you know, hemi, you know, hemi C1, all of that, it goes through, you know, I guess two electrons go through that, correct? Yeah. So that happens twice. Yep, that happens, yeah. Okay, yep. just making sure. Making yep. Sure. Yeah, so. Um, she's just verifying essentially that we have these electrons that are um, one at a time making it to cytochrome C. That's right. Two, two rounds. So, okay. All right, let's go ahead and move on to complex four, okay? Um, what might be considered a cytochrome C oxidase. Uh, and then we'll get into oxidative stress probably for the rest of the day, okay? Um, so cytochrome C oxidase, complex four, the last step in this whole process. Um, let's just evaluate essentially what's happening here. Again, we hit now have electrons um, that have found their way from either succinate or NADH and are now sitting on cytochrome C. That's going to uh, dock onto complex four and pass its electrons onward, okay? And so this is going to be oxidized, okay? Um, and those electrons are going to move through the complex and reduce oxygen, okay? Stoichiometrically, we're going to say it's a half of an oxygen molecule um, because we're really only looking at two electrons. You need four electrons total to um, reduce a full oxygen molecule. Okay. We want to look at just two electrons because we started at either NADH or succinate. Okay. Now, um, beyond that, okay, this is going to pump two protons. So we're going to say that those are pumped. Okay. Moving it from in the P side. So complex one moves four protons, complex three moves four protons, complex two. Uh, four, I mean, moves two protons, okay? And oxygen is what we would call our terminal electron acceptor, okay? It's going to be the, the final electron acceptor of the entire electron transport chain, and it makes water, okay? And that would then round out or end cellular respiration. And cellular respiration began with some carbon source producing carbon dioxide. We saw carbon dioxide production um, in the citric acid cycle primarily. Um, or with glucose, it would be um, also the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And now we're seeing oxygen uh, utilization making water. Okay, those electrons are now being moved to, to oxygen. Okay. All right now, um, coming here, okay, this would be uh, the complex. The complex as a total, the complex four, Okay, and you just have the same, or you just have two different views of the same complex at the top. But as a total, there's 13 subunits in this thing. So this is the surface representation of it. 
Okay. Um, the three colorful subunits are the ones that really are playing the functional role. The other subunits are just kind of shown there in gray um, at the top. We're not going to consider the, the function of those ten other subunits. Okay. Um, down below, the, the highlighting the three subunits that really play a role in this. Okay. Um, and in subunit two, let's go ahead and and talk about that. In subunit two, we'll find a copper sulfur center, copper two sulfur two, okay? And this goes by the name copper A. I have a, a blow up of this on our next slide, okay? But we'll call it copper A. In subunit one, we find two heme groups. Heme A and Heme A3. Okay. And a copper atom that is called copper B. Subunit 3 is thought to be a proton channel, though it's poorly understood how the protons move through this. Okay. Um, so I won't say too much about subunit 3. So copper A in subunit 2, and then heme A, A and A3, and then this other copper atom um, in, in subunit 1. Now let's go ahead and, and move to that. Um, and we can look at these, these different um, portions of these, these proteins. Okay, so this would be copper A. Okay, it's kind of blown up over here. Okay, copper atoms would be this guy and this guy. Okay, yellow would be the sulfur. Okay, so this would be sulfur and sulfur. But that's copper A that I referred to on our last slide. Okay. Um, this here, uh, we don't have a blow up of this. I'll go ahead and highlight it right here though. This guy is heme A. And then what you see here, and it's, you're looking at the, at the edge, and that's blown up over here and we have heme A3 and also that other copper atom that I mentioned, copper B. Okay. Now, I will also point out here on this, this is oxygen binding site. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, you all talked about hemoglobin, or have talked about hemoglobin, and hopefully you talked about how oxygen binds to hemoglobin. Um, very, very similar, if not identical, type of interaction. Oxygen will covalently bind to the iron atom of this heme group. It's a different heme, um, but that's where oxygen is going to bind. Okay. Now, in terms of electron movement through this, we're going to do it very similar to complex one and two. It just kind of jumps along the way. There's not like this complex cycle, um, at least not in the level that we're going to look at it. But you have cytochrome C that will come into this, iron two plus, and it will pass its electrons to copper B to begin with. Okay. And that electron then will just kind of jump along the way. It's going to go from copper B to heme A and then, and then we'll just draw it kind of appearing around heme A3. Now, I will say this, once it gets to heme A3, there's um, the, certainly the copper uh, um, is going to play a role in this, but there are some other side chains that aren't even shown here that play roles in accumulating electrons. 
And then those electrons through not a nice, simple chemical process are transferred to oxygen. Okay. Um, I can't remember the current model, how many steps are in the model, how the electrons get onto oxygen, but there's like eight to ten steps. Okay. It's not it's not like a straightforward, you know, just popping electrons onto oxygen. Okay. So it's it's fairly complex. We're not gonna go through it, but Cytochrome C will just keep giving electrons and they'll start to accumulate around heme 3. Okay. And those will then be past oxygen, making water. And so what we could do then draw draw here is this oxygen, half of an oxygen, okay, becomes water. Okay. Of course we would new, need, if we're gonna do that, we need to stoichiometrically say there's two of these, two of these, okay, that are gonna give electrons. Now at the same time, last thing to really say here is this. Somehow, okay, two protons are going to be pumped through this thing. Okay, so I didn't really tell you this, but let me go ahead and write out the membrane here. Okay, this would be the P side and this would be the N side. Okay, so two protons would be pumped through that. It's magical. Just like biochemistry, it's magical. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to really go into it in, in any more detail. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, could there be something like coenzyme Q that helps pump protons? So um, what I do know is that uh, probably not. So what what um, has been recognized is that there are portions of this protein that are homologous to other proton channels, okay, um, and ion channels. So the th current thought is that there's mechanisms similar to those types of channels. Um, however, it, again, this is the last time I checked, which has been granted a little bit, so we might have a better understanding of it now, but um, uh, it, it would seem that there is some other mechanism besides what you know, besides the coenzyme Q. Probably more akin to something like what we are proposing for complex one, where there's conformational changes that will allow acid-base um, chemistry to occur between side chains that then move when they get protonated, and it kind of hops up this acid-base chain. Other questions? Okay, let's do this, okay? So we are certainly going to, and we'll do this on Monday, we'll start to think about how all of that process that we just looked at will lead to ATP production, okay? Um, because there are now, we can see how protons are being stored on one side of the membrane. We'll look at how those protons will move through that membrane to make ATP. Um, however, before we do that, I wanna go ahead and talk about a very important topic, oxidative stress, um, and this is really actually a pretty germane topic when we start looking at electron transport chain, because the electron transport chain can be a generator of what we consider oxidative stress. So this is a special topic, um, and we're going to start here. When you start to think about oxidative stress, oxidative stress is the result of something um, that we commonly call ROSs, reactive oxygen species. Okay, reactive oxygen species would be a superoxide radical or a hydroxy radical. We'll look at um, those on our next slide. But if you have an accumulation of reactive oxygen species in a cell, then that cell is considered to be under oxidative stress. Okay. Right now, oxidative stress um, can be, and this is why this is an important topic, okay, um, it can lead to such things as cancer. Okay, if left unchecked. Um, it can lead to uh, cardiovascular disease. Okay, it can lead to, in a real acute sense, cell death. Okay, so it can just right out kill the cell. Okay, depending on the accumulation of those things. Um, it's been linked to diabetes. 
okay? And I mean, we could just sum up this, it's been linked to death, okay? All right, so oxidative stress kills you, okay? Pretty much anything that kills you that's not like being run over by a car or jumping off of a cliff or, you know, you know something like that can be linked to oxidative stress, okay, and reactive oxygen species. All right now, in terms of things that will generate reactive oxygen species, for us today, very importantly, metabolism. The processes of metabolism can lead to reactive oxygen species, in particular mitochondrial metabolism. Okay, and that's what we're going to kind of jump off from. There are other things though, UV radiation for instance. Okay, we're all looking forward to the summer and developing oxidative stress. <laughs> okay, I'm okay with that. You gotta have to die of something, you might as well enjoy it. Okay, ionizing radiation, which I, I wouldn't advise. Okay, x-rays, gamma rays, uranium, you know, stuff like that. Okay, um, these are big generators of oxidative stress. Uh, smoking, okay, would be a big one. Okay, and then um, everything else. Okay, so pretty much everything. Water, stuff like that, okay. Oxidative stress, I mean reactive oxygen species come from a lot of different things, okay. Um, and so this is a very important aspect of um, biochemistry and cellular biology, right? There are lots of things that produce reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species in high enough concentration can lead to some fairly terrible things, okay? Um, in fact, it's estimated that um, of the oxygen that we take in on a daily basis, about 0.2 to 2 percent of that will be converted to a reactive oxygen species in your cells. At that level, if not dealt with, it's lethal. Okay, and you say, well, that doesn't sound like very much, but it's enough to, to destroy things, okay? Um, so reactive oxygen species will, um, they can um, destroy lipids, okay, or affect lipid um, metabolism, in particular membrane lipids. So they can disrupt membrane um, structural integrity. Uh, certainly they can have an effect on genetics, okay, so they can lead to damage of DNA and RNA. That can, of course, lead to mutation. Mutation can, of course, lead to cancer or some of these other things. Um, they can uh, affect protein function. They can destroy proteins um, um, and affect their function, so that can then tinker with lots of different things in the cell, okay? So a very important aspect of this um, is to, of course, reduce oxidative stress. So you need antioxidants um, to do this, and we're going to look at two in particular, glutathione and NADPH. Okay, so our conversation will center around these two um, antioxidants. naturally occurring within our cells, okay? And so these would then be the thing that reduces that 0.2 to 2 percent of the oxygen that becomes a reactive oxygen species, okay? okay. Now, I, I do want to make a distinction here. I think this is really important. It's important to recognize that with ROSs, we're not talking about ROUSs, rodents of unusual size, okay? So, the origins of those are re not really well understood, but they're from the fire swamp. The best way to overcome those is Wesley, okay? So, farmer boy turned pirate. If some of you are like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Princess Bride, I'm just, all I'm gonna say, and I believe Netflix is right now streaming Princess Bride. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's your homework for the weekend. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> It got mad at my, at my mention of reactive oxygen, or rodents of unusual size. Talk amongst yourself because I can fix this, hopefully. Okay.
Okay. We're back in business. All right. So, anyway, ROUSs, right, avoid ROUSs at all costs. Okay, acute death is the result of those. Okay. All right, now, in all seriousness, let's go ahead and go here. Okay, so reactive oxygen species, let's go ahead and think about this. First of all, um, to begin this, this conversation, when we think about reactive oxygen species, um, one of the things that will lead to increased levels of these in your cell is essentially a slowdown of the electron transport chain. So flux through the electron transport chain for whatever reason is starting to slow down. And there are lots of reasons that that could be the case. Um, but one in particular would be just a low level of ADP um, in the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay, low levels of ADP mean that ATP synthase rate will go down. And if ATP synthase rate goes down, then movement of protons across the membrane will go down. Electron transport chain, then flux will go down. Right? Now that's not ne necessarily a problem unless electrons keep feeding into the chain, but there's nowhere for them to go. Okay? And so what that happens then is they can accumulate in the chain, and then the oxygen that's made it into the cell is exposed to, in many cases, free radicals. Okay? We looked at a number of different places in the complexes where a free radical is produced, right? Ubiquinone can become a free radical, okay? And, and all the, the flavonucleotides can be, become free radicals. Okay, so there's lots of different places where an oxygen can pick up an electron and become a radical form and become then reactive oxygen species. Okay, so anytime there's really uh, a slow down electron transport chain, what will happen in that case is that the citric acid cycle will keep on churning, NADH will keep on moving to complex one, electrons will keep going into that, and then they'll just start to accumulate. Okay. Oxygen, just to, as a reminder, is really poorly soluble in aqueous environments. That's why we have hemoglobin, right? You can't really move oxygen in an aqueous environment, right? So in those environments, then oxygen will really be found between the leaflets of membranes, okay? And if it's found in the mitochondria, then it can be exposed to all these, um, you know, uh, electrons in the electron transport chain and become these, these reactive oxygen species. All right, now that's what this slide is attempting to show. We've got this oxygen here, okay? And that oxygen can interact with maybe, let's say, a ubiquinol molecule or a semiquinone radical that's accumulated in, the, in, in this environment and pick up this electron and become essentially the superoxide radical, okay? This guy right here. Now that guy, super, that superoxide uh, radical, can become also, can degenerate into a, a hydroxy free radical. Okay, and these two are the primary components of what we call reactive oxygen species. Damaging, harmful. Right? They're gonna go on and they're going to um, disrupt membrane integrity genetic information, proteins, all sorts of things, harmful. Okay. Now, how does your cell deal with these? Well, okay, the first line of defense is gonna be this enzyme that's found both in the cytosol as well as um, the matrix of the mitochondria, and that enzyme is called superoxide dismutase. Okay. This is expressed in high levels. Okay, in both of those environments, it'll essentially take two protons. We'll avoid some of the chemical details here, but it's going to take two protons, okay, and take that superoxide radical and make hydrogen peroxide from it. Okay, we're not quite out of the woods yet with the hyd uh, with hydrogen peroxide. Okay, and the reason being that hydrogen peroxide can just as easily break up and become go back in that direction. Okay, towards the hydroxy radical, or, and this, is, this would be the, the hope, that hydrogen peroxide can be converted to water by this enzyme glutathione peroxidase. Okay. Another enzyme that will do this is catalase. It's not shown here. Catalase will take hydrogen peroxide and make water and oxygen from it. Okay. Of course, the problem with that is that you just keep putting oxygen back. Okay, and oxygen is part of the problem. Okay. But catalase is a really efficient enzyme 
that would be found in a cell that could do this as well. Okay. Now, glutathione peroxidase. It's going to take these hydrogen peroxide and it's really going to make, they don't have this stoichiometrically correct, it's going to be two waters. Okay. And it's going to use, as you see here, glutathione. Two of them. Okay, now what is, or GSH, what is that? Okay, well let's, we'll come back to this slide here in just a moment. Let's go ahead and look at this. This here is that molecule GSH, glutathione. Okay, and the way that we've drawn it here, this is the reduced form. And I'm showing this thiol group that would be reduced. Okay. The reaction that we were looking at on our last slide, catalyzed by the enzyme glutathione peroxidase, takes two of these. Okay, it takes two hydrogen peroxides. I'm sorry, one hydrogen peroxide. Okay, makes water from it and GSSG, which would be the oxidized form of this. Okay, and I'll highlight this, that thiol group that I highlighted above, you know, they form a disulfide bridge between these. Okay. And then of course water is, I mean that's not going to be harmful. Question. Um, it is forming, let's see here, uh, it would be two waters, I'm sorry. I, I think I said that on the last slide. Two waters. And that's glutathione peroxidase, okay? And this is one of the frontline defenses against oxidative stress. Now, coming back here, we have to also consider this. Once that GSS, so we, we just on that last slide looked at this, and we arrived, we arrived here, okay? That GSSG has to be regenerated back to GSH. There's only a limited supply of glutathione, reduced glutathione in the cell. And so that is the job of this enzyme called glutathione reductase, okay? Glutathione reductase is essentially doing this. Going back in this direction, and it, to do this, uses NADPH. Okay. And then the cycle can just keep going. And so the normal generation of, then, of these right, oxygen-free radical or reactive oxygen species, um, those can be dealt with by superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and glutathione reductase. Okay. Now, something that you'll notice here, the final thing to, to really note on this slide, is that this NADPH, right, I have to regenerate that in the mitochondria, and to do that, it's going to take electrons from NADH. Okay, this enzyme here is nicotinamide nucleotide transhydrogenase. And that's a, you know, long name, nicotinamide nucleotide transhydrogenase. Trans meaning essentially there is moving electrons from one nicotinamide nucleotide to another. Okay, in this case it's moving electrons from NADH to NAD plus NADP plus, making NADPH, and NAD plus. Okay. Now understand, in conditions where this pathway is going to have to increase in terms of flux, electron transport chain flux has gone down, which means that right, NADH concentrations, if the citric acid cycles keeps going, are going to go up. 
Right? So you have a source of electrons, and those are the electrons, instead of feeding, keep feeding in an electron transport chain, will feed into this nicotinamide nucleotide transhydrogenase, okay, making the needed NADPH to keep then glutathione reductase working so that glutathione peroxidase can keep working. Questions? It's exciting stuff. Okay. Now, um, the last thing here, well, we have actually got quite a bit. Let, let's look at this real quickly, okay? And this will kind of set the stage for Monday, okay? We said that what we looked at here, uh, this process right here, oxygen free radical went into the matrix of the mitochondria and that's what how it was dealt with there's nothing preventing that oxygen free radical from going in this direction right and accumulating in the cytosolic environment so the cytosolic environment has to have some way of dealing with this as well okay because um, the oxidative stress is being produced in the mitochondria could just as easily end up in the cytosol causing significant problems. And so what we will do on Monday is we will look at this pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway. And I will let you go four minutes early in honor of opening day for the Rockies. Yeah, question. So what exactly does that mean? Nicotinamide nucleotide transhydrogenase is what you're talking about. Yeah, why don't you come down and ask me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, have a good weekend.